Hello class, welcome to lecture 11. And in this lecture, we're going to take a closer look at the gradient wind balance in natural coordinates that we looked at in the previous lecture. But here we're going to actually take a closer look at it and see what exactly see what exactly it means for our flow patterns in the atmosphere. So this first segment is going to be very math heavy, just to give you some fair warning. But the segments that follow this will not be as math intensive. They will have some math involved with them, as pretty much everything in meteorology does. But it won't be as math intensive as this first segment. But let's go ahead and just get through it. So this was the equation that we left off with at the towards the end of lecture 10. We were working with the gradient wind balance. And if we want to, we can divide through by this negative sign that every term has and get something that looks a little bit cleaner. So again, just to refresh your memory, this is the centrifugal force term, the Coriolis force, and our pressure gradient force. And this is all; uh, these are all forces that are acting uh, 90 degrees to the left or to the right of an air parcel. So nothing acting along the air parcel's path. So the end goal here, if we want to solve for uh, the solutions for the wind flow into the in the atmosphere, then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to solve for this uh, variable V, this variable capital V, which you looking at this equation, you might be thinking, oh, that looks like a quadratic equation. So, and the answer to that is yes, is in fact a quadratic equation, which means we're going to have to invoke the quadratic formula to actually get the solutions to this gradient wind balance, which is going to be so much fun. I know y'all are excited for this. So, Quadratic equation, just to refresh your memory on what that looks like, opposite of b, where this coefficient b is the, or this variable v is the coefficient in front of the linear term, b squared plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4 times a, a is the coefficient that's in front of the quadratic term, and then c is the coefficient that doesn't have any v in front of it, or any variable x, whatever it might be. Here we're solving for v, so we worry about the term that doesn't have a v in it. So the coefficient in front of the quadratic term is just 1 over r. Again, r is the radius of curvature. The b is just equal to the Coriolis parameter f. And then the c is just the pressure gradient force that's acting uh, normal to the flow pattern. So here we can actually, I'm going to actually separate the numerator of the quadratic equation here. And this actually makes the math a little bit easier. But uh, I'm going to separate the numerator here so I get minus b over 2a plus or minus square root of this term right here. Remember, may remember from algebra classes, this is called the discriminant, square root of the discriminant divided by 2a, just separating the uh, numerator of this fraction. Now, we can go ahead and actually start plugging in these values. So plug in this stuff for a, plug in this stuff for b, then plug in this stuff to c to get this lovely mathematical mess. And we can do a few things to clean up this mathematical mess and make it a little bit more sightly to look at. So one thing we can do is we can take this one over r and bring this term up into the numerator to get a cleaner fraction. And we can do that for the same thing. We can do the same thing to this numerator right here. That's a little bit easier to work with. So here we get that the wind is equal to minus f times r divided by 2 plus or minus r over 2 times the square root of f squared minus 4 over r times d phi dn. Now something we can actually do to simplify this even more involves taking this r over 2 term and bringing it inside of the radical. Normally the way you simplify stuff is to bring outside of the radical stuff outside of the radical, but here we're going to actually put something in the radical. So we're going to take this r over 2 term, put it inside the radical, and by putting it inside the radical we basically square this entire thing. So by bringing this r over 2 underneath the radical, this basically becomes r squared over 2 squared or r squared over 4. And by bringing that term inside of the radical, we can distribute this r squared of 4 to this uh, bit of subtraction here. And distribute the r squared of 4 to the subtraction here to get an expression that looks like this. So we end up with the square root of, or we get with, or we end up with v is equal to minus f times r divided by 2 plus or minus the square root of s squared times r squared over 4 minus radius of curvature times d phi dn. Still a little bit messy, but it's not nearly as bad as what we started with. But I do want to sort of draw your attention to this stuff that's going on underneath the square root here. Let's suppose that this quantity on the other side of the negative sign, let's suppose this quantity r times d phi dn, let's suppose that's zero. That would mean I just have the square root of f squared times r squared over 4, which would just be the square root of fr over 2. So if this term is 0, then I just have 
a term that's so I basically am just left with uh, f times r over 2 which is the same exact term that we have over here so and that's going to be something that we uh, do want to keep in mind going forward once we start taking once we start interpreting the result that we get from solving this uh, lovely equation here now let's consider a different case let's say that this uh, product is positive so that means I've got a number minus another number which is going to give me a number that's smaller than f times r over 2 so if this is just 0 then I get f r over 2 but if I take this f r this seemingly uh, the seemingly value for f r over 2 and subtract it from another number, I'm going to get a quantity that's smaller than f times r over 2. And similarly, if I take this product here and make it negative, then I get f squared times r squared over 4 plus some value, so this term of the radical is going to be some number that's larger than f times r over 2. And these are going to be some de some mathematical details that we're going to want to keep in mind going forward. But uh, just make sure that the logic behind that actually makes sense. Make sure you actually see why these different combinations of r times d phi dn actually produce these results. This actually, the, you, just make sure you understand how these different combinations of r times d phi dn actually influence uh, how large actually influence the size of the term underneath the radical. So that's going to do it for this first segment, and in the next segment, we're going to actually we're going to take a closer look at uh, the solutions that we arrived at, and take a look at um, all the best, all the possible combinations that we can have from that uh, solution. So, with that, I will see you all in the next segment.